Hello everyone, this is Sam Spade, and in this video we'll be making our first enemy with a state machine. But before we get to making an actual state machine, we should talk about state. You can think of state as just being the way something is. A switch could be in the on state or the off state. A game could be in a pause state or an unpaused state. And state can be anything from something very simple, such as just a bit of stored data, to something very complex, mixtures of code and actions, nested states, and more. Now let's think about the elements of a state. First, you have the state itself. Whatever is happening while something is in that state. But in addition to whatever happens in the state that we're in, eventually we're also going to want to think about whether or not anything should happen when we enter a state or when we exit a state. And of course, what is the trigger or triggers that will move us from one state to the next? In this tutorial, we're just going to deal with things that happen in a state and the things that trigger new states, but in future tutorials, we'll also cover how to handle entering and exiting states as well. So now that we have a basic idea of what a state is, let's talk about state machines. There are more formal definitions of state machines and different types of state machines, but for our purposes, a state machine is just the thing that handles something having multiple states. It needs a way to determine what the state is and what code to run while in that state. One important thing to understand here is that a state machine is an abstraction. It's a conceptual machine. There isn't going to be one thing necessarily that you can just point to in code and say, this, this is the state machine. And there can also be different ways of implementing the exact same state machine. But the whole thing conceptually is something that we can think about and describe and in fact diagram, which is what I'm going to do next. So I'm going to show you a basic diagram of our crusher's state machine. It's going to have three states, a waiting state, a falling state, and a rising state. And the way we're gonna diagram these states is that each state is going to be represented by a box and the trigger, the thing that will switch it from one state to the next is represented by an arrow with a condition. So we have our waiting state, and there can be code that runs inside of the waiting state. Then we have our trigger, which is that the alarm fires. So the way I'm gonna set it up initially is that our enemy will just have an alarm that will switch it from the waiting state to the falling state. It will stay in the falling state until it hits the floor, after which it'll enter the rising state and continue to rise until it hits the ceiling, at which point it will go back to being in the waiting state. And this particular enemy will just continue through these three states. Wait, fall, rise, wait, fall, rise. But speaking of states, now we get to the real question. How are state machines implemented in GameMaker? Well, there are several main ways to do so. The first is a switch statement. This is what we're going to start with, and I think that it is the simplest and most straightforward version. But it does have some limitations, and we're eventually going to hit those. The second way to implement a state machine is with functions. You can use functions in connection with switch statements or just functions all by themselves. And we'll eventually create state machines that use this method. Finally, prior to GameMaker Studio 2.3, some people used instances themselves as states. But now that we have structs in 2.3, instances can and probably should be replaced with those. And eventually we'll build states and state machines out of structs as well. But again, we're gonna start with the simple switch statement. Now the last thing I want to say before we switch over to GameMaker is that state and state machines are useful concepts for many, many things, not just enemies. So while these tutorials focus obviously on making enemies and we're going to be using state and state machines in that context, you can use them for a lot of different things. So as you're coding, remember that these ideas are tools that you have and that you can use not just for enemies, but maybe for your UI, your buttons, your game state, and so on. I also want to point out that there are some really interesting tutorials by other people on YouTube for how to implement state machines. And I'm going to put a couple links up above and down below to those videos. But now let's actually switch over to GameMaker Studio. So here we are in GameMaker Studio. We have our new enemy, Object Crusher. I've given it a sprite that is 40 by 60. Its origin point is at the top center. This doesn't matter all that much, but it does make it easier to place in the room. As with all our mask sprites, this is just a full image mask. And I've already placed it in the room. Here's our enemy itself. It has a create state, a step state, and then two alarms. For the moment, I'm gonna stick with using GameMaker's built-in alarms because they're very straightforward, simple, and more than sufficient for what we need right now. I do have a whole series on different ways to do alarms in GameMaker Studio, 
There should be a link in the top right, and we'll be using some of the more advanced methods down the road. But for now, the built-in alarms are more than fine. So here's our create event. We'll have HSpeed and VSpeed, which we'll need for our move and collide script. We have gravity, and then we have one other variable. We have our variable that holds what state we're in. Now, there are a bunch of different ways to do this. Like I said, you could use numbers, enums, and honestly, the enum way is probably how I would do this normally. But I really like strings for teaching purposes because it's very easy to see what state you're in. The debugger will show you text rather than a number, which it would do if you were using an enum. And while it's not quite as efficient, when we're just doing simple enemies like this, using text is fine. If you were to do this in your own project though, I would probably use enums and we will be switching to that later on. So now we can look at our step event and here we have our state machine. We have our three states, waiting, falling, and rising. And let's look at each of these states individually. So in our waiting state, all we do is we check to see if alarm zero is set to negative one. This is how you know if a built-in alarm is off in GameMaker. If it is set to negative one, that means the alarm is off. So we're gonna set it to room speed times three or three seconds. And that's all the code that we really need in our waiting state. All alarm zero does is set our state to falling. So when this alarm goes off, we will switch our state to falling. The falling state simply adds gravity to vSpeed. And if alarm one is off, it will check to see if there is a place meeting one pixel below the object. So as with the last tutorial, we're offsetting our mask by one to check for a collision with the floor directly beneath us. And if there is a collision with the floor directly beneath us, then we set our alarm to be room speed or one second. We could reverse this. We could do a place meeting check and then only if the alarm is off, set the alarm. But I like checking to see if the alarm is off, then we do a collision check and then we set the alarm. Both versions would actually get you the same thing, but this version is a little bit faster because it won't do the collision check once the alarm is running. Alarm one, much like alarm zero, simply switches the state to rising. In our rising state, we are adding negative gravity. So again, this is that idea that we talked about in the first tutorial with the little square. By reversing gravity, we're gonna make it move up. And then we're clamping V-speed so that it never actually goes up very fast. So it will fall quickly, but rise at a steady rate. And finally, we're checking to see if there is a mask one pixel above, and if so, then it's hit the ceiling and we switch back to waiting. Up here, we reset our alarm and this whole cycle continues. Note that we're always doing our moving collide. We could move the moving collide script inside to one of the states, but in this case, we always want the moving collide script to run. So we're gonna keep it outside of all of our states. So you can see that our square starts at the ceiling. It falls, so it's in the waiting state. Then after the alarm goes off, it goes to the falling state. And then after a short delay, it goes to the rising state. For our crusher, we could actually vary it in a lot of different ways. For example, we could replace the alarm in the falling state and simply switch state directly to rising once it hits the floor. This would remove the delay. You can see that now we don't have any delay. As soon as the square hits the floor, it starts going back up. We could also comment out our clamp so that it would go back up in the same way that it falls without a limit on its V-speed. So here you can see it going down as fast as possible and then up as fast as possible. And of course, you could change any of these variables. Instead of adding to V speed, you could add to H speed and it would go left and right. You could reverse whether it started on the ceiling or the floor simply by reversing gravity. And of course, you could even remove states. For example, maybe you don't want a wait state. Maybe it just bounces off of the floor and bounces off of the ceiling. We can make a temporary change just by starting it in the falling state, making the falling state go to rising and making the rising state go to falling. So that falling goes to rising, rising goes to falling. Now our crusher just sort of bounces back and forth. So let me revert all these changes with Control Z. And here we go. Something that we'll do in a future tutorial is change this waiting state to more of a detecting player state so that it stays in the waiting state until it senses that the player is below it. And then once it senses that the player is below it, it will switch to the falling state. So rather than doing so automatically, it does so when the player walks underneath it. As always, I would recommend that you do some experiments on your own, that you modify this code in a couple different ways, see how different things work. For example, what happens if you mess with the gravity number? What if it's a really low number or a really high number? Or how would you get this object to start with a delay? 
For example, let's say you wanted to put four of them like this and you wanted them to go one after the other, this one, then this one, then this one, then this one. What would you need to add or change for that system to work? So there you go. I'll be back in the next tutorial to add states to our little square and get both of these enemies interacting with a player object. But in the meantime, if you weren't familiar with either switch statements or alarms, check out the videos down below.